Well, welcome to Selling Leaders Ask an Expert Atlanta Edition. Today we're talking with Jan Hare, who's our agent expert for Central, Southern, Western, Cobb County. Jan, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. And so we like to start with, uh, you know, when we venture to new cities, we like to learn about unique items there. So quirky, unique, something that you would find in Atlanta or Cobb County that you won't find anywhere else. And you can't say the varsity because everybody okay, else is going to Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> no offense to the varsity, but it right, should be right. repeated. Okay, what is it? So um, one of the really interesting things that we've had happen over the last couple of years um, is that we have tons of filming around us. Um, you know, first it was The Walking Dead, which we still have here, but anywhere around, like, I mean, from where I live, um, just down the street, you'll see these yellow signs with black letters and you're like, what does that mean? Is it some weird, you know, ZFQ or whatever it is. And so we have tons of, we've given very good um, tax breaks to the filming industry, which has allowed um, that to really thrive in our market and our, and it makes our city interesting um, in a neighborhood that's just about three miles from here. Um, they did a movie and they had to repaint the whole house and of course all the neighbors are standing around well my kids went to school with their kids and so you just kind of, it's just kind of a fun thing but I think that that's been very good for our economy here um, so I, I think it's probably one of our more interesting things we're not Hollywood but we're the I guess the Hollywood of the south and you know when Tyler Perry studios are here. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's been, it's been a fun thing to see around. And yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. That's a really yeah. good one. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let's, uh, let's talk about you outside of real estate. So where did you grow up? How long have you lived in the area and where do you live now? Okay. I'm a Texas girl. And so of course I had all family last week that were Oh, in right. that, and thank goodness one of them had heat, and my 90-year-old mother was good, and my 93-year-old aunt, and they all went to one house that had it, so that was good. So I grew up outside of Houston, and uh, I have lived in Atlanta since 19, well, let's see, I got married in December of 90, moved to Australia, and I lived in Australia for three and a half years, and then we ended up here in Atlanta because of my husband's job. And we just kind of, we looked around. And so we have lived in Marietta since we bought a house in 1994. And that's where we have lived ever since. And so it's, it's been, it's been a good place to live and a great place to raise kids. And my backyard has a national park in it. So I can literally walk out the door and go walk in the trees and take the dogs with us. So right. it's, it's, it's a nice place to live. It really is. Right. And one of the other, um, actually the stager, our stager on the panel was talking mm -hmm. about the green space in Atlanta and how yes. it's just like a sea of green when you get there. And, and there's so many parks and, and um, reserved like private areas to be able to just enjoy nature. And I think that's sometimes that's hard to find. So that's nice. Yeah. Well, and we, and it's very, it's very hilly, quite frankly. I mean, you know, we're at the base, you know, as the, as you go up into the Blue Ridge Mountains and that sort of stuff, even though that's up in Kentucky, I mean, it kind of starts in North Georgia and goes up. And so, yeah, we have some really beautiful, really, really, it's very green, mm -hmm. you know, even in the winter, you know, you still have your evergreens. And so it's, right. it's really green. Here. Right, right. Okay, and so, and you know, talking about Central, Western, Southern Cobb area, where are your favorite places to eat, coffee shops, places to okay. go? Okay, so there's a lot of stuff that gets, you know, uh, there's, I always think, eat local, support those people that are in your community that have businesses, and not saying that there's not great chains, but I always think if you could do that, support support your neighbors. So um, as far as a coffee shop, breakfast place is a place called Reveille and they, oh my gosh, they have these amazing waffles things, you know, just, you know, fresh squeezed orange juice, you know, where they literally put in the orange, it gives you your juice and they bring it to your table and that kind of stuff. And just, you know, so just some really good food from that stand place, that standpoint for breakfast. Um, Probably lunch or dinner, there's another place called the West Cobb Diner. And what I love about it is that you can, they have, they have a great vegetable plate, <laughs> and, oh. you know, and it's locally owned. The lady, Lauren, that owns it, she's had it and she lives in a neighborhood where a good friend of mine lives. So, you know, it's, 
it's not, I think to support those local businesses is really, really important. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's oh, what that's we okay. get. Yes, I mean, every time I interview people, I got to write this place down because I, I feel like every time I go to Atlanta now, I'm just going to be like doing a circle of where I'm going to eat around <laughs> this city because everything sounds so good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so talking about where you are, what is the housing market like? Okay, so this is my analogy. I talk in a lot of analogies because I think people can pick like that. So imagine a tank, a fish tank, and that tank happens to hold piranhas. <laughs> and you are a piece of hamburger meat. <laughs> It's getting lowered <laughs> into the tank. Um, it's, it's pretty full on. Um, a perfect example, I have a client that's been under contract. We're going to be closing in the beginning of March. And when we went in to um, write an offer, we ended up, she had conventional financing. And we offered $16,000 over asking price. Now it was in the low 200s. And so we, we have a pr pretty reasonable market. So you could easily, um, I think our average point, price points about, it's, it's in the, it's three to 350, somewhere in there. So 225 was what the house was listed at. And we offered 241 and she's paying her own closing cost. We beat out four all cash offers. Wow. I also told her story. And which is a whole different, you know, of where she came from and everything um, as a single mom. But it, that's what it's like. We did, they, I mean, you sit in a position of, as a buyer, you've got to go in with a very, very strong offer. And you can't be um, asking for this and that. It's if the way the market is now and what it is expected to do is continue in this vein. There is not enough inventory for the number of buyers in the market. Right. But if you can get it, if you can get a house, awesome. You know, and as a seller, you're going to get top dollar. But that's really, that's really what it's like. Though my office last year, we had a phenomenal year. Um, we, we, can tr we control about where we're in our market space. Um, we probably control about um, just my office, about 20 to 22 percent of the market. So mm -hmm. we have quite a good market share. Right. Um, and so, you know, when when you talk about that, you know, we're all in there. You're always trying to ask people what's going on. Hey, I have a buyer who's looking for this. You know, what do you have that's off market or what's coming? And, you know, so a lot of it, having a, an agent that's going to go out and search for you, what you're looking for is incredibly important and not just sitting back of what's coming on them, what's on the market, but what's right. coming and it may never hit the market, quite frankly. Right, right. Or it does and then like an after an hour, it goes to, to it's on. Sorry, sold. Yeah. And you're like, wait yeah. a minute, like, I didn't even yeah. get with even multiple to go. offers. An agent, my offer, he had 47 offers on a property a couple of weeks ago. 47. How would you even choose between 40? I'm you, sure you just, you start, you start with like wiping out certain finding, you know, if it ain't, if it isn't at least full price, you wipe those off. If, you know, then maybe it's types of financing and you're going to, you're just going to keep, you got to find a way to skew it down. And so right. it becomes cleaners better. Right. So. And it's interesting. I follow a lot of community forums for real estate and, and some people, buyers will say, you know, my agent signed me up for this email where I'll get an alert when something comes up, but I haven't really heard from them. And I'm like, in this market, you need someone that's going to be looking for you, not, not just letting you on an, right. kind of an auto email. Like if you're very serious, you're going to have to really dig and, right. and, right. and find. Right. Something. And I, yes, I think you're right. And part of that is like kind of talking to people in your marketplace, whether it's not just agents in your office, but agents in the surrounding offices that you become um, you know, friends with. And so it's like, hey, do you have something? I have people that'll call me and say, hey, do you have anybody? I'm going to be putting this house on the market. Do you have a client that's looking for X? Mm -hmm. um, and I may not have something, but my business partner, Joni, might, you know, that sort of thing. So we, you know, it's, it's, it's really a lot of that. It's also, the buyer may also come across something. And if you see something like, text me, call me, do some, I don't care if it's 10 o'clock at night, right. let me know. Um, because you know, you, you just gotta, gotta figure out what's the best way to, to find it and when it's, it, I say this, it is chess, not checkers. Right. It's funny. The one agent I was talking to, she's like, I'm, 
you know, you can't show a home after a certain time period, but it's so competitive right now. I guarantee somebody would oh. be like, 1 a.m., can we just go right now? I, you know, I just want to like look in the window. Yeah, if it's vacant, sure. <laughs> yeah. Go in your pajamas, no big deal. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. I don't need to look at you. I'm good. Just bring, just bring your robe. We're good. Right. We're, fine. We're fine. Just keep it covered. Uh, okay, so so now I know you mentioned this before, but how many years have you been in real estate and how did you get involved in it? Okay. I, like I said, April 1 will be 25 years. I've had my, my license. Um, 10 years ago, um, I got my broker's license, which is a next level up. And I decided that it was just something, it was after our fun 2008 debacle. And I had, there, there was time in the market. And so I just decided I wanted to have a designation that other people understood. They don't understand ABR or SRES or whatever, but they understand broker. And I thought it's made me become more aware of just my industry. And that's the reason that I did it. Mm -hmm from that uh, standpoint. And you asked me one other question. Oh, I was gonna say, um, how did you get involved in real estate? Oh, how did I get involved? When I bought my own house. Um, so we had moved back from Australia and we were looking and um, so after, you know, and you know, I just got Shannon, the girl who was my agent at the time, she and I just, you know, we just kind of clicked and she, she said to me, you know, at the end of it, she said, you know, I've only had a couple of people that I really think should pursue this. And she said, I really think you'd be awesome in real estate. And, and because we had been living out of the country for, um, you know, three years, I didn't have an industry that I, we, we were, we had gone because of my husband's job, not because of mine. And so when we came back and I was, you know, I, I didn't want to go back into retail management and I have a journalism degree from the University of Texas. And so I was like, hey, you know, what do I really want to do? And so I took a course and, and I thought, wow, you know, I think I could really like this. And I jumped in two weeks after I was in the business, I sold my first house. Oh, wow. After two weeks. Wow. Yep. Yep. New construction. In fact, it was kind of funny because I was in there the other day. And so that neighborhood has been there for 25 years. It's wow. kind of funny. So we built their house and yeah. uh, we're still friends. So Okay. And, yeah. and so do yeah. you do mostly, do you work mostly with sellers, buyers, a mix, new construction? Yeah. Right. So really, uh, so I'll do both buyers and sellers. I love it when I get to sell somebody's house and sell them a new one. Um, new construction, in fact, because what we're seeing is because there is such a limited standing inventory, new construction is just blowing out the doors. They can't even get um, standing inventory built. So people are having a time frame. Um, so, you know, at, because we have really relatively mild temperatures here, you can build a house in a four, a smaller home, town has it in a four month period, four to six months is generally what you're looking at. Um, and, you know, and even people going out and finding land, finding lots. So that's really becoming much more popular. And building a house and doing that sort of thing. So yeah, so I'm constantly learning that. Also, uh, I've also moved into, I've gotten an, another designation, as I said, SRES, which is a senior real estate specialist. And the reason that I decided to get that was because I have a mother who's going to be 90 in June. And so I feel like that I'm in a great place to help those people that have big homes that because of either health or they've lost a spouse that they need to downsize and they need somebody. Um, that particular baby boomers and the generation before that, they're very, they're very much about wanting one on one. They want face to face. They want a phone call. They it doesn't mean that they're not tech savvy, some of them really are, but some are not, and they really love that, they love that hand holding, and because I have a mom that's in that, I really truly understand, and Joni and I feel like that that's just, we, fe we felt led through that, through, you know, through our hearts to give some of that, so it's always constantly changing, and finding, and how, how do we, how do we come better at what we do, how do we become, how do we stay involved, and helping people where they need to be helped. Right. And I feel like that's the best way to do business, or at least that's how I look at selling later, is looking at problems and just saying, like, how can we help? Yeah. You know, being, where, being where a are problem we needed? solver. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Based on solving a problem, not based on 
because in the real estate industry, everything is based on how much money can you make, at least right. from the from the business <laughs> and aspect of it. <laughs> Uh, and, and in the startup world, it, it's this obsessive uh, um, conversation about how much money can you make. And, and I, I guess I'm kind of the oddball because I'm like, well, I just want to connect people. I don't want anything for it. Like, I, you know, right. you get, you, yeah, well, yeah. that's, you, you know, I think that that's part of it is sometimes it's not about the money that you mm -hmm. get. I mean, yes, we all have to make money to live, but I think right. part of that, that, and this may be partially part of my faith and belief that I'm, that we are here to help people as well. And if you do, I just believe that you can do the right thing. Don't always look for money and you're going to come out on the top anyway. And if you've helped somebody and you, you've done the, you've done the right thing. Right. <laughs> Right. And I mean, that's always what I've tried to teach my son. Always do the right thing. Right. And, and, and if somebody's not watching, that's okay too. You're doing the right, right. thing for you. Right. It feels and good inside too. You know? Right. Right. Uh, so let's talk about doing good. How about finding good? So how, <laughs> without saying, ask friends or family, I right. am moving to the area. I don't know a soul. How would I find a good agent? Right. Um, Wow, that, this was probably one of the harder things to think about because it's like, how do people do it? So, because most of my business, honestly, is referral based. So it's coming to me through somebody that either knows me. Um, it is on somebody who might find me, but you know, I think that social media, whether you love it or not, it's, it is where people go and people will post things about it. Now, I say, use that as a start but then investigate. Don't always take it at face value. So if you keep seeing the same thing, there's probably truth to it. Call that person, pick up the phone. They, they can't hurt you through the phone and see how, what was the conversation like? So I think that probably social media, if you find that you want to live in a particular area, drive around, do you see particular signs? So we, you at least know that, well, there's an agent in that area that's probably fair, fairly savvy for it. And if you know, like, I want to be in this school or these schools in this area, that that's another great way. Again, that's you having to know a little bit about the area. Um, and, re, you know, reviews, go to different, you know, go to different, there's definitely different one. There's a, there's a website that, that I've started using some, it's called Rate My Agent. And, um, so once a transaction is completed, I send it to them and they can go online and they can write a review. I can also send, write a review about that other agent in the transaction because it's not, it's a two-sided thing and it's got to be good for both sides. And if it, if it doesn't work for both sides, it's probably not going to work or it's so contentious that nobody wants to be at the table at the same time. Right. And, and I didn't, you know, I didn't know that you look at years of experience and that doesn't always qualify you as to be really good at your job. But then, no. you know, you look at some other aspects and, and I started following peer reputation because that is able to see what other agents say about each other. And, and I, I didn't know how much that can impact you if everybody hates your agent and nobody wants to work with you you know, how is that going to make your whole experience? Right, work out for right, you? right. Well, I think that that, and, and I'm going to, now I'm going to kind of take what you're saying with that and just kind of tell you, that's one of the things that I have started saying, using to, and I, I want to say to my advantage in some ways is that I didn't want to sit here and say, look at me, I'm awesome. I always just get in, work, do a great job and, you're, you're going to be rewarded. But I have clients that have, you know, you know, kids that are grown and they're now out of college and they're buying a house. And so I started telling them, I was like, let me just tell you what my 25 years has done. First of all, I have a reputation. I have a pretty good reputation in the market. And it's like, I've won deals for clients when in those competitive times because they know how I work. They know I know what I'm doing. They know that I'm a problem solver and I'm going to do whatever I can to make that deal work. And so that's given me a good reputation. So yes, I think it's really important. And you have to, even if you get, even if you and the other agent have an issue, you always still have to be a professional because your reputation, end of the day, that's what I have. Right. That's all I have. Right. I don't sell a product. I have knowledge and I have my reputation. In 25 years of experience. 
Yeah. And it, yes, and that, <laughs> and there is, and you can't, there's some stuff you can't buy. That's just, you learn through, through trial and error and doing and asking questions. And so. Right. And that's why I think it was important for us when building these Ask an Expert panels is to have someone that has the years of experience in the trials to, to be able to answer a question without having to check with someone else. You know, it, right. it's, right. it's relying on those years of what you've learned to help someone right. else navigate. Um, yeah. Okay, so when we're looking for an agent, what's a good question to ask and what's a red flag uh, that you would immediately think, oh, I can't use them? Okay. Um, I think there's a lot of questions, but I would say the very first thing you might ask an agent, especially if you don't know anything about is like, ask them, why should I pick you? Why should I pick you? And have them give you, Mr. Miss Consumer, their 30 second elevator chat. You're going to, you know, if they can't know why, well, because I've lived in this area and I've done, you know, I did $7.1 million worth of business. I'm in the top 10 in my office. If they can't give you something, whatever that may be, or, you know, I sold 45 homes. I, you know, I put 45 clients in homes last year, whatever that is, if they can't tell you something about it, tell them, you know, why should I pick you? I think that that's, I think that that's really important. It's going to tell you a little bit how they're going to think on their feet. Um, but red flags, once you give has how they communicate. To me, that is the most important thing because this is, technology aside, it is a people business. It's a people business. Um, how do they explain the process? When I meet with a first time home buyer, um, what I like to do very first is I like to bring them into the office and we are not going out to sit house, sit, go look at a house. Um, before we ever start, I want to explain to them the process. I want to show them what a, what a contract looks like. This is what you're going to get. This is what we're going to work off. This is how we're going to do this process. I want to educate them because this is the most important, probably this is the biggest purchase most of us will make in our lifetimes right and they need to understand that process and how it works and why and how you look at how money works in your benefit and why this kind of financing may you may qualify for two different you may qualify for fha and conventional why would it be to your advantage to have fha and why would it be to your advantage to do conventional that to me is the most important things because at the end of the transaction, I want a more savvy consumer in the market. Right. Because when they're ready to come back and buy a rental property or to do a move up, they're going to feel comfortable and they're going to say, we're going to pick up the phone and call Jan. That's what. Right. We don't teach kids coming out of high school and college. They don't understand how interest works, how compounding interest works. <laughs> Right. It's an amazing thing and how it's your money and how you need to make your money work for you. Right, right. I, I think that's, that's what I do is I sit down, I explain the process, talk to them about what they're looking for, set up a searches, but us sit and look on the computer, get a game plan and go. Right. I think that's key. You know, it's interesting you said that you sit down and talk with them because a lot of times I read how, you know, consumers are saying, um, my agent gave me this paper, but I don't, I don't really know what it is. They didn't explain it. And it, it, it could be an agreement, a listing agreement. It could be, you know, and there's no conversation about commissions. There's no conversation about what happens when you sign this or what if you don't want to, like, there's absolutely nothing. Right. And so, you know, if your agent isn't sitting down with you and explaining how the whole process works, then you need to find someone else. Absolutely. Well, right. Well, and we have a fiduciary responsibility to our clients to explain that. I mean, it's something, I mean... Theoretically, <laughs> misappropriation of earnest money, which I always try to explain what earnest money is. I mean, we can go to jail in the state of Georgia for, for, for mishandling things. Probably not the first time we can get sanctioned. You can get your hand slapped. You can get a fine. You can, I know an agent several years ago that went to jail <laughs> and oh, wow. can never work in any. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was a, it was a, it was a big deal. And um yeah, so uh, I take it very seriously. <laughs> you know, it's other people's money, but I take that really, really seriously about, you know, taking care of, you know, watching their money like it's my money. 
Right. Um, in a seller's market, what are some things that buyers can do to be more competitive? Okay, this is, this is a great question. We talk about this all the time because it's like we're constantly trying to do that. So I think the first thing is write a clean offer. And well, what does a clean offer mean? You're not going in there and asking for this and that. You're, you're, you're giving your best offer up front. Don't say, well, I'm going to offer this, but if they come back, you may not have that opportunity. So you better go in with either your very, very best offer or you have an escalation clause in there, which allows it to um, increase to a cap. So that's one thing. Be prepared to pay over asking price. Like I was telling you about my client that we paid $16,000 over asking and she paid her own closing cost. Um, Cash is always king. I mean, they're going to always, I mean, unfortunately, um, when you're competing with a bunch of people who are willing to pay cash, it's just, it's tough. It's just tough. So you, you if you're going to have a loan, one, have the very best loan that you can have and, you know, go in there and be willing to, to put your best foot forward. Right. Um, there's another thing, and I think you had, you had sent me a question that said about appraisal contingency waivers. So with that, we are now seeing that if you come in and your, your contract is at X, but the appraisal comes in at Y, when you have an appraisal contingency waiver, it doesn't mean, because if you have a loan on a property, the lender is going to require an appraisal because it's really for their benefit, not for yours as the buyer because that loan you can almost be sure is gonna be sold. It's gonna be bundled with a bunch of other loans and sold. Right. So we, when you take that into account, you can waive the appraisal contingency aspect of it, of saying that if it comes in 10,000 below, you can waive that and say, the buyer will pay the difference between the appraised value and the contract price. Now you're bringing that in cash and that's in addition to any of your down payment, any of closing costs, that sort of thing. So you have to make sure that when you agree to that, that one, you've got cash or the ability to get a gift of cash from a family member. Um, you just, you've, it's got to, you've got to look at beyond just, you know, oh, I'm gonna put that down and I hope I'm gonna win. You right. better hope that you, if you, you better put your money where your mouth is and better have that. In, it, right? Yes. So waiving the appraisal contingency is that doesn't mean you're waiving the appraisal. It just means that you're not saying to the seller, hey, I'm still willing to pay X because I've got that much cash. If it comes in something that's ridiculous, you know, again, that if you have done, if you've looked at your comps in the area, you should know about where it's come in. Right now we're seeing them being pushed, prices pushed a little bit um, and appraisals pushed a little bit. So, because it's, um, an appraiser just has to justify what they're saying. So if they come in and say, it's this number, they have to, they have to justify what that is. Right. So that's what it is. You're willing to pay cash. The cash difference between the appraised value, hopefully that's not the case and that the, the, the house comes in and the appraisal comes in at, at that, then you're good. Not, then you've got to make that decision and you got to think about that prior to writing the offer. Right, right. And, and Hopefully I think that makes sense. No, it absolutely does. And, and, and I think that's, you know, when you say a, a, a waiver, I think people don't understand, like you, you have to pay that money somehow yep. and it, and it yep. can't come out of your loan. So you have to figure that no. out. No, and if you borrow gift money, and so let me explain that. So somebody said, well, my dad's got gift money. Gift money is money that comes, it's, it's usually, it has to come, most loans stipulate that it has to come from a family member, goes in and it comes without any strings attached. So that's what a gift money is. You can choose to pay that back, but the lender is saying, there's a letter, there's proof that that family member has money, it goes into the buyer's account. And that's what that is. So I do know that people do that. So um, hopefully you have good relationship with your family mm -hmm. members. That's makes you, makes not you everybody stronger, is fortunate stronger stronger enough to have that. Right, right. right. Uh, okay, well, my last question, actually there's two. Um, okay. So what do you wish consumers 
understood better about the buying and selling process? Or well, maybe they um, understand <laughs> or a misconception about the process that that we just sit back and we get paid that we just we just collect money and it's far from that there has been many a time not many a time but there's been a time when something's not going well and i'm up at three o'clock in the morning because i'm worried about my client and trying to think of a way how can i make that work how can we how can we come to an agreement um that we have you know as agents most people that I know that are in this business um, truly have their clients interest best interest at heart there are people out there that don't it's in every industry we all know them we all know the guy in the office who's like he's he's a right. flake or he's lazy or whatever most agents are not they truly do have the clients best interest at heart um, and I think that they need to understand that, that we don't just sit back and aren't getting paid and that we give up time with our own families to go show a house or, um, you know, write an offer at 10 o'clock or midnight. I've right. done that before. Um, just something, you know, anything to give our clients the advantage. Right. Um, and to know that that, you know, that when people ask us to cut our commission, what they're asking them is this, the, the what I say is that how would you feel if your boss came in and said, I just want to pay you 25% less this month? Um, we have to pay taxes. We have to pay our broker. We have to pay marketing. We have to pay assistance. It's, it's not just all free and clear money. So, you know, and we do that. We make good money, but we work hard at it. And it's our job is seven days a week. Right. But, you know, and I think people don't understand uh, from a commission standpoint, you know, we've talked like the referral fee platforms that take 30% from agents and, and aren't clear about it. But, you know, 42, even though, I, that's the worst uh, I had. 42%. 42 uh -huh. Just to sell you a name. No. Oh. 42%. Yeah. Oh. It was, it was a corporate reload deal, but that's what they wanted was 42%. Right. Well, and, and reload too, you know, it, it's kind of flies under the, the radar of the process, but yeah. reload does the same thing. And, um, <laughs> 42, oh my gosh, 42, I can't get over that. Usually I, when I write about this stuff, it's like 25 or 30, but now I know yeah, I can start out. When I started 30. off 25 years ago, it was 25%. Wow. Now it's 42%. That's yeah. just, oh, it's crazy. But you know, it, and, it, and you know, I started selling later as just a consumer. And, and so I, even I didn't understand, you had, I had that perception that an agent takes, uh, say the commission split was like $10,000. They get to put all that in their pocket. And, and, you know, newer agents are giving up uh, more than half to yes. their brokerage. Yes. So there's half of that. Plus, yes. you know, if they're in Uncle Sam will always want their part. <laughs> yes. But yes. But then you have like your own insurance, you know, if yep. you're by Absolutely. yourself or you don't have another. So, you know, I think that's a very valid point and, and something that probably isn't as, as explained as it should be. Yeah. You know? Well, and I think it, people are uncomfortable to talk about that, quite frankly. They right. just, they assume that people realize part of that and they don't. Um, but I, you know, I'll have people that will call me and say, I'm so sorry to bother you. It's, and it's six o'clock at night. And I'm like, are you, and like, I'm always like, you are not bothering me. This right. is, I'm here to help you. Now, if it's midnight, I might feel a little bit different, right. but at six o'clock, it's like, no, this is part of it. This is part of the service industry. This is why I want to represent you. And I want you to be able, I want people to feel so good at the end of the transaction that they won't have another name to give, but mine to their friends and family. Right. That's what I hope and pray for. And it has been, I, you know, a lot of my success has been because of that. And, right. and that I continue to love this business. Right.